Hello and welcome to WYTV7. I'm your host, Byron Pettit. I'm the host of Family Matters. Family Matters airs every Thursday at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Family Matters has guests that come on here and speak about real life situations in real time. I hope that when you tune in to the episodes each and every week, that what you hear will charge you to do something different, maybe charge to make a change in your life or maybe the life of somebody else. Today, I'm excited about this guest. He is a friend. He is a musician. He is a producer. He's a composer. He's all things music. He is, I'm proud to say he is my children's music teacher. I welcome you today, Curtis Keys. Curtis, Thank welcome you. to the show. Oh man, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I can't wait to discuss some things. I know, but just because of our personal relationship, there's more to be desired with our our, uh, our conversation. So we never get enough time to really dig in. So this is a good medium. Hey Amen, appreciate that. So Curtis, tell me first of all, is Curtis Keys your biological name? Is that your stage name? And tell me what, if that's your name and where you from and how did you get into music? Well, my stage name is Kurt Keys, C-U-R-T-K-E-Y-Z. Um, but my, my government name is uh, Curtis Hayes. That's my real name. Um, and that's my name my mom gave me um, way back when. And um, I'm from Great Falls, South Carolina. So that's a small town in, in South Carolina off of uh, the Interstate 77, I-77. Um, one stoplight town. I think I graduated with a class of maybe like 75 people. So super small, um, super closed in, kind of close knit. Um, depending on what you're interested in, you know what I mean. Um, so that I and I say that because I always call where I'm from like a culture desert um, because um, we're funneled culture through like TV and stuff like that. However, not really like experiencing culture or making culture like big cities like Charlotte, Dallas, Houston, New York. LA, DC, Phoenix, you know, whatever, where they make culture, whatever their culture is, and it goes out to subsidiaries. So I, that's how kind of like I was, re, I wasn't received well when I was a kid for just being in love with music. So in, in my town, it's all about basketball and church. It's like, that's like every, that's what brings everyone together. So growing up and um, growing up, with my love for music, um, I was kind of alienated in a different in a different way um, or whatever, which grew my love for basketball because I, I really I didn't have any relevancy if I didn't you know really play basketball. So, um, but that's how I got into music. You know, really just for my grandfather being in a quartet group, take, dragging me to to men's choir rehearsals and stuff like that. Um, my mom can play piano a little bit, like really like a little bit when i say a little bit a little bit uh and she can sing um and then actually man I, I you know i met my dad in 2019 um and when i met my dad you know i've i've come to realize like he's a he's a great keyboardist he's a phenomenal singer um and so it's like i didn't realize i had the innate ability he's like I, was, I just came out the womb with like this love, this zeal for music, um, this talent, you know, I had, until then, I just kind of always felt like, man, I, I have this love and I don't know where it comes from, but it's just, I have this, it's so, I have this passion, you know what I mean? So um, that's kind of how I got into it, you know, went to, got into band and all these things and obviously I went to college and yeah. Okay. Well, you talked about, you mentioned that you just met your father relatively, I guess, three years ago, 2019. So when you grew up, like you said, I grew up in Great Falls, small city, graduating class, of maybe 75. Who was, and you mentioned your grandfather, as you said, dra dragging you along to quartets, the choir rehearsal, going to church and what have you. So it seems like there was a big influence in church growing up. Talk about how that kind of shaped who you are as a young man today, or, um, did it not shape you? Because some folks say, well, I had to go to church and I kind of distanced myself from it. But talk about what it was like for you growing up in um, in that environment and going to church. Um, well, ch yeah, church was, I mean, obviously church was like made to be like a normal thing in my household. Like um, every Sunday, 
Um, you know, if we can make it to Bible study, we want to go. My grandfather was the chairman of the deacon board um, quite a few times since I, since I was a kid. Um, he was like one of the leaders of the men's choirs, of the men's choir. And so I learned how to play drums and then went over to um, learn how to play piano later in my life when I was in high school. But it was, it was like I learned a lot of principles, Christian principles, in my home. You know what I mean? My, my grandparents, um, my grandparents aren't really like uh, commercially churchy. That's kind of how I like to say it. Like they're not um, Pentecostal or what, you know, of, of the more like, um, uh, the more, uh, the persuasion that gives, you know, aggressive, you know, whatever, Christian them more so than they were just like really practical and loving. Um, that's, that's just how how my grandparents raised me they is just they were always super loving um super gracious to, in in a community way that allowed me to see Jesus like in my in my home so that really shaped me more than anything because at church I really wasn't received well because I didn't get a chance to actually like serve in what I was good at you know um I had to wait in line and wait in line and wait in line um, and so when I finally like actually became good enough, um, I only was trying to prove myself as far as being a musician. But um, my home um, in, in Georgetown, in Great Falls, South Carolina, is uh, was was the was the church for me. Okay. Now you you continue to mention grandparents. Now did you live? Did your mom and you live with your grandparents? Were you raised by your grandparents? Yeah. So uh, when I was a kid, my mom. Um, my mom, we moved around a lot, um, because my mom was like just trying to find her career in administration. Um, we lived in Indianapolis, Atlanta. Um, we lived in quite a few places. Um, so when when I got old enough to go to school, uh, we moved back to Great Falls, South Carolina, and we lived with my grandparents for a moment. Um, and then my mom. You know, obviously she just started you know, trying to live her life, found love, you know, got engaged, got married and everything. And I moved to Rock Hill, South Carolina for all of my elementary um, schooling. Um, but I was still, for the last two years of that, fourth and fifth grade, I was living with my grandparents um, but going to school in Rock Hill. So she, my, grandpa, my grandmother would take me to school and pick me up from school every day. Um, and then, and then for the rest of my schooling, from middle school to high school, I was back in, um, back in Great Falls, and my mom um, lived with her husband, um, and then she had my sisters, and so they lived with my mom and their dad. But I, I, I continued to stay with my grandparents. So my grandparents raised me. My grandmother taught me how to ride a ride a uh, ride a bike, how to color in between the lines, how to be a gentleman, uh, how to cook. My mother did that. My grandfather just uh, reinforced a lot of things as well. So that's those are my those are my parents. My mom's my baby too, but my grandparents really raised me. Yeah, and the reason I asked that question, there is a song that um, well, prior to the song, in the, the research I did about you, you spoke about like the love that you had towards your grandmother. But your grandmother also shared with you, and I want you to tell the audience audience a little bit about this because I think maybe your song kind of speaks to this, is that the hell that she went through growing up as a child. Mm -hmm. um, so talk to, let the audience know, like you you getting great perspective and insight from your grandmother, who's obviously can share with you what it was like to go through racism back in her times. So kind of touch on a little bit of what she shared with you, as she said, went through hell as a child. Yeah, so, so shout out to your grandmother. I look at my grandmother, Cleo. I love her. Uh, she, growing up, um, I experienced a lot of racism, but didn't have the language to qualify it as such. So, very difficult to not have language. You know, you state you'll stay in things if you don't have language to explain them or to or to, to define them. You will stay in those things. And so now I have agency, obviously, and I have autonomy. I can like actually have boundaries with who I associate myself with, who I work with, 
um, et cetera, et cetera. My grandparents weren't, weren't as fortunate, right? And so because of their age and society, they were forced to go to, um, to segregated schools. And so the track you're mentioning um, is an interlude to a song called Overcome, where I kind of shed, shed light on, um, on the hope factor of racism not necessarily being a thing forever, right? Um, but my grandparents were in the thick of it um, way more than we are now, where because it was it was a normality to jeer black people to throw things at them. And my grandmother speaks of um, of going to school, minding her business, and being you know um, and being disrespected and harassed on her way to school. Um, and so that's a normal thing. And that actually, that conversation was prefaced um, by um, by a few events. Um, after George Floyd was killed, I was um, very vocal about, uh, on social media and my friend groups and everything about what happened to him and how angry I was about it, disappointed I was, and, um, if I'm being honest, I think at that point in my like, in my walk for justice and equality and equity, I think I was just really like young minded, just really wanted to draw people out. I wanted to be polarizing so I can have a conversation, hoping that, you know, you can see my point of view. And so in doing that, I, I, I met my goal. People were coming out asking me, you know, why do you feel this way? And this, that, and the third. And I remember, um, one of my mom's uh, friends, or I guess associates back in the day, uh, he's, he's a pharmacist, I'm not gonna say his name or anything like that, asked me to come speak to him, his, him and his family and a number of white um, ministers uh, in our hometown, you know, explain to me from a Christian perspective, because that's an important intersection. Being a black Christian, black male Christian, is those intersections are important, and they bring, they're, they're way more nuanced than a lot of other inter intersections. But anyway, so we're having a conversation and I remember him saying, you know, yeah, my mother, my mother, you know, she, she doesn't remember a lot of racism, you know, in the town. And so I mentioned that to my grandmother and say, hey, you know, he says, you know, they don't, they don't really remember that. And, and she said, well, that's not true. You know, she was, she was my age or she was a little bit younger than me when this was happening. And so then she recounts her being uh, harassed on the way to school. My grandfather was in the military and he got out of the military because of racism. So I, I glean a lot of information and experiences from them um, in, in regards to racism. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting how you can have uh, folks from the other side whether it can be any any ethnicity or nationality, and they can say, I don't recount that. I don't remember experiencing racism. Um, but sometimes we still walk in it. We have family members or grandparents who are still walking in it. So mm -hmm. it's always interesting to me. It's like, you don't experience the same thing that they experienced it. Yeah, but it's true. It's just almost like if you look at a picture, we both can see the same picture, but we're taking something different from it. That's so. Right it's almost like we have to be able to have those uncomfortable conversations in regards to sure. racism. So yeah. let's do this. I want to go to commercial when we come back. There's a, some specific songs I want to ask you about in regards to some powerful lyrics that you've written in these songs. So we're going to go to okay. commercial break and we'll come right back. Let's do it. Calling all HBCU alumni, supporters, and golfers. It's that time of year again. Yes, the HBCU. Swing into their dreams charity golf tournament on Tuesday, April 5th. If you missed the last one, you have time once again to be epic. Don't miss the golf tournament of the year. 
the Swing Into Their Dreams HBCU Charity Golf Tournament at the Atlanta National Golf Club in Milton, Georgia, Tuesday, April the 5th. Registration begins now. Sign up your golf teams at swingintotheirdreams.com. That's swingintotheirdreams.com. Or call 770-686-7148. That's 770-686-7148. Don't miss it. Uh, Welcome back to Family Matters. I'm your host, Byron Pettit. Um, Family Matters, again, airs every Thursday at 9 o'clock p.m. Uh, Mission statement on Family Matters is educate, encourage, and empower. Today, I'm here with Curtis Keyes, who is a producer, musician, all-around good person. Mr. Keyes, I want to ask you about some of the songs that you have written. In particular, one I like is called Why. And I'm not going to do justice by saying the lyrics off the top of my head. So I'm going to read the couple lines of the song, which I, I want you to speak to. It says, why do you hate us? Is it the color of our skin? Is it the royalty within? That right there. Talk about, talk about that song, why, and where did that come from? Uh, well, that, that, yeah, that song is um, off my EP, Black Heart. Uh, it features Aji. Shout out to Aji. That's my sister. Uh, really good friends with her. And um, that song was actually inspired by the um, everything that went on in 2020. Um, George Floyd, Rihanna Taylor, Ma Alberry, um, and so much more. Um, so many more uh, killings and kind of like injustices there. And I think I just wanted to raise the question because the beautiful thing about art is I don't have to explain it if I don't want to. You know what I mean? Um, I think uh, I heard um, somebody talk about Pablo Picasso. Like, I, I didn't make art to explain what it is. You know, I want you to get what you want need from it. And so um, I am going to explain it, but that that's why it's. I'm glad I could just put out that and just, hey, say, okay, well, raise the question, why? You know, why do, uh, why do, and, and they is a very, like, uh, I say they a lot in that song. I say they a lot on the whole album because I did not want to say white people or white America or, um, or anything like that. I don't think that's fair to, um, the black circumstance or the black plight, which, which is hate, which is like this uh, innate hate. And and sometimes I I always look at, um, I look at black people as like the most beautiful beings in the world. That's how I look, that's how I look at black people. Black, a black woman raised me, black man raised me empowered me, supported me, um, loved me to the best of their ability. There's no reason, no reason to not, um, to not uphold their likeness as royalty for me. Um, and so uh, I always just wanted to ask that question because, and then in the verses, I go on to answer that question. Um, if you go to the verses, I talk about how beautiful our skin is how intelligent we are, how innovative we are, how um, how we are the flavor into our world, you know what I mean? And so, um, so yeah, that's what those, that's what that meant. And I, I didn't really want to um, go crazy deep into that song. Um, and that's why the music on the, in that song is uh, monotonous. It doesn't change. Yeah, I think, I think, because I want to listen to the whole song, um, I was like, "Wow, this is this is this is a powerful song." But I think the part that that you raise as well is the why. The why encompasses so many different races of people besides us. It's the misunderstanding. It's the treating us as an anomaly, and we need to begin to see ourselves as uh, 
the normal instead of instead of viewing ourselves as an anomaly if we can begin to do that that will only strengthen how we feel about ourselves so when we run up against individuals who treat us as an anomaly or an oddness we'll be like what are you talking about that's maybe something you see but you not go. us there you go yeah but but it's a lot of work that that needs to be done which goes back to you know appreciating your grandparents because they poured into you yeah. the greatness of who you are so a yeah. lot of us unfortunately don't even get that whether it be biological parents uh, bonus parents who step in, who are not pouring into us as a people and let us know how great we are. So for you to get that, kudos kudos to the grandparents who stepped in and done a great job. Yeah. Now, you talked about one of your albums, I don't remember it, but you touched on it in, in reading about you was homeless for a, a, bit of, a bit of time, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Talk about the birth of that album, because you, you mentioned how important that album was to you that you made when you uh, was homeless. What what was that period of time like, and what was that album uh, came to be for you? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So that album is called Love of the Like Thereof. That's actually my debut album. Uh, it came out two thousand. It came out in two thousand eighteen, and uh, I started the album when I wasn't home. So I was living in an apartment two of my friends um, in in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and um, it wasn't. It would that wouldn't be the first time I was like technically homeless. Um, I've always been homeless um, as a sacrifice to get to get where I need to go. Um, it never was really I couldn't go home. Uh, in some instances, there wasn't a room at my at my home at my house. Where my grandparents lived because my grandfather is so so giving and so loving. He would let people live with us, you know, whatever you know they need something or they need a place to stay. And so I remember uh, leaving the apartment and feeling like, man, if I get, if I go into another housing situation, I'm not going to end up, I'm not going to be able to pay my debt. I'm not going to be able, be able to, to get ahead or then I'm going to be able to just stay here and be stable. And I didn't want to do that. I think my future deserves more than that. And so um, God just really did a lot of great things, uh, even though I was couch hopping and um, staying at people's house you know, for for different amounts of time, I ended up uh, setting up shop in this uh, storage unit uh, with one of my friends, um, and uh, I would uh, pay some of the like half of the, the the fee for the storage unit. He had his drum set in there and some recording stuff and and everything. I had my I had my little studio set up in there and a little in the corner i had my i had a monitor on the uh, on the uh, on the on the actual desktop i had a monitor on the, it was it was crazy i actually have a photo of it somewhere i'll find it send it to you and uh so at the beginning of the album i wanted to commemorate that by um, i opened up the storage unit so at the top of the album you hear the door opening up in the storage unit so I'll never forget, man, that's where I was when I was recording that album. I was grinding, staying late hours in the night, and I would like go to someone's house and then, you know, go to sleep and everything like that, make money and everything. And uh, I ended up doing, uh, what is it, Two Birds and One Stone, paying off a lot, a ton of debt, um, getting the album done. And the album had um, more than nominal success in the community. Try, I ended up trying it on Amazon and iTunes and did a lot of great things for the album. Um, done a ton of shows between 2018 and 2019 um, before uh, the pandemic based on that album alone. Good. You've traveled to various parts of the country. So that means you've seen and have come in contact with so many different people uh, of different races and ethnicities. Uh, what are you seeing as a common theme when it comes to uh, and maybe in regards to racism or just in regards to family, when you are in these venues performing songs, what are you getting a sense from people um, just in regards? Because I've been to what I call showcases or performances where sometimes the crowd can be mixed and everybody's vibing and having a good time. But mm -hmm. what are you seeing in regards to what the music that you put out? Are you received by all different races of people? Yeah, man. I never forget. I did a, a album release concert. Um, so I dropped my debut album, August. 30th 
2018. And I never forget, I did a, a album release concert maybe in like November because I was on the road. I was still traveling, I'm still doing a bunch of traveling at that time. So I didn't have time to really celebrate in, in concert. And I remember walking out, you know, like we finished setting up, the sound checked, everything is great. And I remember just walking out, trying to get a deep breath, you know, and feel the moment. And I see a line of people. And all those people I never knew. I didn't I didn't know them. Um uh, white folks, um, uh, Indian folks, um, African folks. Just I mean, just a bunch of people, a divert a diverse crowd. Um, and I think sometimes I, you know, maybe I'm flattering myself, but I feel like that's what I kinda have to offer to um to the music industry and to the world is um music for people, for all people, you know what I mean? Um, and uh, obviously you can kind of, I guess, pigeonhole or make a draw a line with, with, as far as the genres are concerned. But I, I, I've never seen, um, I've never seen my music kind of lost in the sauce, you know, when it, when it comes to that. I think people really just enjoy it um, for what it is. Yeah, th that, no, I agree. That's a great point, man, because you see, I particularly believe, man, growing up, you know, I was a child of 78, the 80s, man, whether it was Madonna, Michael Jackson, you think about the crossover. If the music is good, people will listen to it. That's right. You see Van Halen when they would run DMC. Yeah. You see, you see the Beatles with Michael Jackson. <laughs> it's there. You see, you yeah. see, uh, um, Jay-Z did something where I think with, uh, I, don't, I can't think of his name. He did a song, but it's there. If the music is good, we'll cross over. And it's so interesting that music can bring us together as a people. Yeah. But unfortunately, we can see the same sort of hate on TV, but we're visualizing that totally different. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and that's what I think for us as a people sometimes is a struggle. Like, mm -hmm. we've got to be able to see the same thing and be, and be able to at least collectively agree that this is wrong. Yeah, Whatever I, that wrong is, we got to be able to agree with that. I, I agree. I think... Um... I think uh, bias has a lot to do with that. Mm -hmm. I think bias has a ton to do with that, um, which is why, like, I'm an individualist. I'm also a nonconformist. So, if you see me doing something that isn't stereotypical, it's because of that. I, I don't like, um, I don't like assuming things of people, and I think um, the what happens is um, with our industries and just society, you know, a part of society is labeling, you know, and doing um, and giving language to who someone is, what they are, what they think, what they create, what comes of them, uh, who they hang around. Um, and I don't think that that's wise for anybody. Um, obviously, I am, I am ingratiated into an industry that has genres and that has um, labels and it has um, a lot of different things that forward that type of marginalization across the board. However, um, I think we are we're in an age now with that throughout creativity, society, um, throughout creativity within society, we have a lot of mediums now, a lot of opportunities to express ourselves individually without that lines and not those lines. And I think that gives us a lot more opportunity to be vocal, to be um, and to to advocate for a lot of things that. That grieve our heart, you know what I mean. Um, I, I I'm not I'm a big Kanye fan as as far as his music and things like that. I'm also a big Kanye fan as far as his um, confidence and individuality. Some of the things I don't agree with everything he says. I'm also not his friend, so I don't have to. Um, I am I'm an onlooker, but he said something very very uh, profound. I just read the other day, yesterday I think. He said, you know what? I'm here to I'm here to uh, make sure that what you thought was a red flag or what you thought was something that, that was outlandish um, to make sure you know that that's just a mirage. That's just a, that's just a smoke screen. There are no limits, really. There are no boundaries, really. Um, and so you got to say, I always tell my siblings this and I, I, and I hush, you got to say no now so you can say yes later. You know what I mean? So we can have control and be able to have agency over what we actually desire to talk about and to and to uh, advocate for. Yeah, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Keys, we got a couple minutes to go. 
Um, I want to give you an opportunity to tell the folks if they want to, A, get to your music, how do they get to it? And B, if someone wants to reach out to you, how do they get a hold of you? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so again, my name is Kurt Key, Kurt Keys. Uh, that's C-U-R-T space K-E-Y-Z. You can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at that handle. Um, no spaces in between that, though. It's C-U-R-T-K-E-Y-Z. Um, you can find all my music on Spotify, Apple Music, Pandora, Tidal, um, and any uh, any uh, any digital outlet um, at that same handle. That's C-U-R-T-K-E-Y-Z. Um, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm going to have a lot of content coming on there uh, this uh, this year. Uh, check all the albums out. Um, Love of the Like the Rub, Black Heart, and my the latest album that I released in August of 2021, which is called Kirk Is. Um, it's about a culmination of me, you know what I mean? So um, a lot of a lot of good stuff on there, and you can find me there. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate you coming on the show. I appreciate what your grandparents have done and poured into you and what you continue to do. I appreciate your humility, okay? Hey, now, man. God bless you, bro. Yeah. All right. Now, if you'd like to reach out, uh, to me, you can reach me at www.practicalfamilyresolutions.com uh, or you can email me at practicalfamilyresolutions at gmail.com. You want to get a hold of me, 704-288-4612. If you like the show, please hit the like button. But also, if you'd like to donate, we don't turn down any donations because we don't operate off air. So please go back to WITV7 and hit donate. Thank you again, Mr. Keys, for the opportunity to come on and bless us with what you have to share. Have a great day.